I'm Brenton. Welcome to Spectrum Today. Glad to have you with us. Unfortunately, Ruth is not with us today. Hopefully, she'll be feeling better and back here in a day or two. And so keep her in your prayers and until she is back with us. Yeah, we have a great guest coming up. We have Brian Watson from the Internal Revenue Service. And it's great to have him coming out, sharing with us information that is helpful to avoid tax scams and also just to give us a little bit of extra guidance as we're preparing for tax season. Can you believe tax season is coming up? You've got, well, a few weeks still to get your taxes ready to go uh, for, for 2020 and make that filing. So it'll be helpful to have someone here from the IRS to give us some direction today. Hey, let's get right into the news today because there's a lot of things that are happening. And there's a, an interesting thing that really relates to those of us who are from New Mexico and those in the first congressional district because our U.S. Representative, Deb Holland, was yesterday uh, approved to be the Secretary of the Department of Interior. She becomes the first uh, Native American person to be uh, placed on a cabinet position and to, to be confirmed there. The vote was a, a fairly close vote. It was uh, 51 to 40, so it was was uh, one that was closer than many others in the margins, but she's hailed to be one that uh, many are excited to see uh, having a, a Native American background to uh, also be one who is going to be dealing with a lot of things that have to do with, what is it, some 600 uh, tribes that are uh, in, in the United States, uh, Native American tribes. So that is going to be something interesting. And of course, someone from our local area. She hails from Laguna Pueblo, and they tell us she is a 35th generation New Mexican. Now, I don't know how you figure that out, but wow. I mean, that is, that, that is somebody who has deep roots in New Mexico. So uh, Deb Holland, of course, is going to be moving directly into the cabinet position for uh, President Biden. And uh, that is kind of a, a piece of definitely local interest. And we'll have to kind of keep our eyes on that as she represented the first congressional district here in the uh, generally the, the Albuquerque area for, I'm trying to think, was it two, two plus years, I believe, as she stepped into some of those things. So uh, keep an eye on that for future days. Another item that is in the news, and this one really kind of relates, I think, to all of us, has to do with freedom uh, that people would have during the pandemic versus states that really relied on lockdowns. And now as we're starting, I mean, I know that we're still in a pandemic mode somewhat, but things you have to say are getting better. I, I think I saw in a local reporting that uh, here in New Mexico, one day in the last few, we were down to around 160 new cases. And, and that's great. When we were nearly at 1,000 plus, uh, I think we were approaching 2,000 at one point per day. So you, you are seeing a, a significant decline. Of course, vaccinations are starting to become more readily available, and that's in, uh, improving things uh, and life for a lot of people. But now that the focus is shifting, what worked better? Keeping people locked down where there was not a lot of freedom, where people were really restricted in their homes and, and where they were going, to the other side of saying, hey, you know, we're going to allow you to be much freer in your application. And we're just, in some ways, we're going to use some caution, but, but really mask mandates and some of those things were very much on the back burner. And the, the comparison is now showing data comparisons between California and Florida, two very populous states with very different um, approaches. And yet they are finding that their, their per capita number of uh, infections per 100,000 was, was very similar. It wasn't that different. Now, Governor Newsom uh, in California, as you've probably watched in the news, was very restrictive on keeping people locked down. Businesses uh, were, were relegated to not being able to gather. Churches, as you recall, for months and months and months until the Supreme Court intervened, were forbidden from having services as well. Uh, meanwhile, in the state of Florida, uh, Governor DeSantis in, in that state uh, was much more relaxed with, with policies and, uh, and has been one of the most open states that we've seen. Now, here's where some of the rankings come out. Both states rank right in the, the middle with COVID deaths. Florida is listed as the 27th and California is listed at 28th. But the policies employed uh, were, were very different. Uh, Governor DeSantis had no statewide restrictions and is really not allowing cities to find people who don't wear masks. 
So you can see that that, that really uh, has caused there to not be the, the widespread utilization of mass as there has been in places like Cal California. Uh, 32,000 Floridians have died from COVID-19. And, uh, but that is about the same type of, you know, again, numbers per 100,000 that they had in the state of California. So I think what we're going to be seeing over the course of the next several months is a real dig into did it matter? What, what, did it really matter which way we went? Were some of these things just an infringement on personal liberties? Or did they have a health benefit? Because as we come through this pandemic, uh, certainly this will not be the last health crisis that comes uh, our way in the United States. And hopefully we don't have another one of this magnitude for another hundred years. That was about the last time that that happened. But certainly it's time for us to kind of find some additional information that is going to, to provide for us uh, information as we move forward. Here's kind of an interesting thing. And this is one that as a Christian, you have to really celebrate. It has to do with the fact that Christians are helping Jewish immigrants to immigrate back into Israel. And one of the things that scripture talks about is this in gathering of the people of Israel back into their homeland during the last days. And we're seeing that happen very regularly. The International Christian Embassy uh, of Jerusalem had sponsored a rescue flight and they brought in 226 Jewish immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Now there had, you know, there had been some challenges with COVID and in fact, if people were coming in they had to uh, be quarantined and things for a while, but people are very excited to be able to see other Jewish people who are wanting to come home to be able to actually see that event taking place. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, as you look forward to the return of our Lord, that should be something that all of us celebrate because this is a sign of the, the last days. It is a sign of the end times and, and speaks to us of the fact that we are getting closer and closer to the return of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that certainly is something that we all uh, should be encouraged about and in the days that we are living. Another thing that is important for us to, to be thinking about has to do with uh, the things that are happening with transgender athletes. Now, this is another one that is right in the forefront. And we're starting to see some states that are making moves to say, we are not going to allow biological males to be competing with biological females. And there's, there's a restriction. I believe in, in the state of Alabama, there is some legislation that is, um, that is out there that is going to be even looking at not allowing parents uh, to, to have, to, even with parental consent, for, for uh, kids to have a, a gender change uh, operation. So, you know, th this thing with, with female athletes having to compete against uh, transgender uh, athletes who are biologically male, that's becoming a big issue. Um, it, it really eliminates a fair athletic uh, playing field, uh, truly. And so th th in some of the southern states, and you're starting to see things rise up in Mississippi and Texas, and as I mentioned, in Alabama. So I would encourage you to keep an eye on that because I think that's going to be something that's really going to be an item that we uh, are going to want to watch. Well, I would encourage you to get on the mailing list. We are right at the point of sending out another update newsletter, and we would encourage you to get on that mailing list. All you need to do is to call us up at 505-884-8355, dial extension 101, and tell them, I want to be on the mailing list, I want to get the updates. We'll be glad to help you, and we would love to stay uh, connected. Watch the Daystar Network 24 hours a day on KAZQ 32.5. Certainly appreciate each and every one of you who are supporting the ministry here at Alpha Omega Broadcasting. And I just want to say straightforwardly, we can't do what we do without you. You know, we've been getting some wonderful response from you, our viewers, whether it's uh, you picking up the phone, dropping us a note, and saying, you know, we are watching, we appreciate you, we're praying for you. Uh, we pray for you. I pray for you. I pray that the Lord will connect you with the right ministries and the right ministries with you to be a blessing uh, mutually. Pray for the ministries that are on Alpha Omega Broadcasting. We're blessed to have about 60 ministries 
who share encouragement and hope and life and instruction and peace and joy and fulfillment and the things that God's word provides for us into your life every day. And we should pray for those ministries. I hope you do because we want to to be built up one with another. Now, how can you be supportive of the ministry here at Alpha Omega Broadcasting? It's simple. All you have to do is uh, just make a decision to make a donation. A recurring donation, a monthly donation, is certainly a great blessing to us. One-time donations are, are welcome and, and so uh, so appreciated. But those recurring donations help us to be able to build a, a steady opportunity of being able to depend on that that donation on an ongoing basis. How do you do that? Go online to www.kazq32.org and just uh, uh, make the donation there at the Donate Now tab. You can mail it. A lot of people like to mail it. That's you know, I, I know that that's kind of old school in some regards, but let's be honest, a lot of us might be a little old school. That's okay. You can mail it in to Alpha Omega Broadcasting, 4501 Montgomery Boulevard, Northeast Albuquerque, 87109. Hey, and don't feel bad if you mail things in. I was talking to a, a national provider the other day, and they were trying to get everybody paperless. And they said that wasn't working very well for them, so they were backtracking on it. And then there's another way that you can do it. You can just call us up at 505-884-8355. And uh, extension 101, and we can set up an ability to do a one-time or recurring donation for you using a debit or credit card. Thank you for your support. Watch Jimmy Swagger and the Sun Life Network 24 hours a day on KAZQ 32.3. to have with us today Brian Watson who is with the Internal Revenue Service and I know that you work in the areas of criminal investigation but also giving out great information to help people know about what the IRS is all about. Brian thanks for coming back to be with us. Hey thanks for the opportunity Brenton. We're looking forward to learning a little bit. I, I think it's always good to start off. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get involved with the being involved with the IRS. I mean, that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, path, a career choice. That's true. So I was in college. I started as an engineering major, quickly realized too much science and physics. So I became an economics business major, okay. which at UCLA is where I went to school. That's where all the accounting majors went. And I wanted to work in a big six accounting firm. They didn't hire me. And then I found out that the IRS had this position. Basically, it's federal law enforcement within the IRS. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of like an accountant and a police officer, a combination of those two jobs. And I thought that's perfect for me. I, I love law enforcement, I'm good at numbers, and I've been with uh, IRS criminal investigation as a special agent for 25 years now. Wow, all right. Well, as we think about tax season, because it's coming up, I mean, you know, you think about April 15th is the traditional day for filing taxes. What are some of the new things that are out there that people should maybe think about or know about this year coming out of a really strange year with the pandemic somewhat behind us. Right. So one of the, the first things is you're going to be asked a question, whether it's by your return preparer or if the software you're, you use at home on your computer to go through your tax return, they're going to ask if you have any virtual currency, if you own virtual currency. So think Bitcoin or one of these other thousands of other virtual currencies. That's something new this year. And we obviously want you to answer the question honestly. The, you're also asked if you have foreign bank accounts. So it's a very similar thing as well. And then also what's new this year with the CARES Act, you can um, donate, have donations that you made to charities on your tax return, even if you take the standard deduction. Because mm. back in 2017, the government basically doubled the standard deduction. So a lot of people stopped itemizing because the standard deduction doubled. But this year with the CARES Act, you can take a $300 donation. And then for 2021, next year's tax return, it's gonna be $600. Wow. So I encourage people to keep good records of, of any donations that they make. Well, a lot of people probably did make donations. We've had a lot of folks here who uh, have been from food banks and food pantries and things of that nature. And so you, maybe you took a bunch of items and donated and helped or gave cash to be a blessing to somebody else. So that, that's important to know. Hey, 
the pandemic, though, how has that stimulated criminal activity? Because I would think that the criminals are always looking for a way to, to make a little bit of money uh, in any crisis. Is that true? Right. So any natural disaster, anything like a hurricane, a fire, floods, anything like that, criminals will use it as a way to trick people into donating to a fake charity or something like that. The big thing we've seen with this pandemic is combined with the three economic impact payments, the stimulus checks. And right now we're in the process of, of the, the third one. The criminals are trying to take advantage of that by tricking people into providing their personal information. So one of the most prevalent ones that we saw is a text message. It comes to your phone and it says supposedly from IRS Treasury COVID Fund. For, and it says $1,200, and it says we need your bank account information so we can direct deposit that information into your account. Well, if you click on the link in that text, that's not the IRS. It's not Treasury. It has nothing to do with COVID. It's just a criminal trying to steal your personal information. Wow. Right, and we've seen test kits, home test kits. We've seen fake charities. We've seen business opportunities related to COVID. We've even seen vaccines on sale for relating to COVID. So there's a lot of scammers out there. The big thing with this economic impact payment, you don't have to do anything. It's gonna be automatic. All right, so it, it, it should go directly to you. Did it go by mail or by direct deposit either way? So if, if you normally, if you've provided the IRS with your direct deposit information, which is the best way it's to get typical, a tax refund, yes, that's the way it'll happen. If you, the government does not have your bank account information, you will be paid either by a check or a prepaid loaded debit card. Okay, all right, so the, know that and, and remember that. What are some other tax related uh, maybe scams that you're seeing because you know we're getting again closer to the, the season where people are filing taxes and I and I've heard of people uh, who's for example they go to file their taxes and somebody else already did in right lieu so of them. <laughs> right so we the, the number one scam on our IRS dirty dozen lists of tax related and financial scams is phishing for the last four years. And phishing is with a PH. It's the phony emails, mm -hmm. text messages, just like I mentioned with the COVID thing. But we see that supposedly coming from your bank saying that your account's been locked and you need to verify your account because of suspected fraud. Then they ask for your personal information, name, social security number, and date of birth. And that can be used to file a tax return in your, in your name. Luckily, we're seeing a lot less of that tax-related identity theft. But these scammers are always trying to get your personal information for one thing or another. One of the scams that we've seen the last year or two is phone calls and emails trying to tell you that you are a winner with the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these scams are actually coming out of Jamaica. And also in other parts of the United States, they tell you you've won $5 million and you've won a car. And then they send you email directions on how to pay the taxes to the IRS. And even the email will, will look like it came from the IRS, but we're not contacting you. These scammers, that's what they want to do. They want to get you to pay some money, and then, then they're going to keep asking for more and more. And they are targeting our 80-plus population because they figure that's where they're going to have their most success. Oh, that's... Wow, you know, I mean, it seems like the criminal mind, if used for better purposes, would be, uh, would, would, could really do some good things. But man, those are some pretty sneaky tactics that they use. What is a ghost preparer? That's a term that you kind of hear thrown around. Well, what, is, what is that all about? So a ghost preparer is someone, is a paid tax return preparer who does not put their name on the tax return. And if you think about it, if you wrote a book or if you painted a nice, a beautiful painting, you're going to put your name on it because you're proud of your work. These people don't want their name associated with this return because it's fraudulent. So by law, if you pay someone to prepare your return, they need to put their name on the return. They also need to put their prepare tax identification number, a P10, that's required by law. And um, they should give you a copy of the return, either digitally or paper. And they should go over the return with you line by line and explain everything. Taxes are complicated. For some people, it's like another language. But I would say they, for most people, that's <laughs> exactly. <one. laughs> so they should be able to explain anything. But the key with the ghost preparers is they, they disappear after filing season. They they're like ghosts. They they're gone. And but you want to hire someone that's going to be around all year 
if you get a letter from the IRS saying they have a question about your return? Well, you know, I sometimes hear of people who say, well, you know, I have a friend and my friend just helps me and um, maybe they maybe they own the, the tax uh, software and, hey, I'll do it for you. Does that person have to fill out a form also? If they're paid. If they're, if they're paid, they have to put their name on there and their PTIN. If they just do it as a favor, not necessarily. But, you know, you, you are That's ultimately responsible for whatever's on that return. Even if someone else does it, even if you pay a very high-priced CPA or enrolled agent, you are ultimately responsible for everything on the return. So you choose your return preparer very carefully and review it and make sure you know what's on that return. Still seems like it's a foreign language to me, Brian. And that's, <laughs> it seems like, <laughs> but that's why we want everyone to file. So I, I do my own return, and I use tax software, and it basically asks you all the questions. It's, right. it's. I'm not going to say it's idiot proof, but it's, 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 it's simplified where your average person should be able to go through the questions and and fill in the blanks, and then produce a tax return at the end. Says the person from the IRS, you should be able to do this all by yourself. All right, well, let, let's keep moving. Tell, tell me a little bit about electronic filing. Is it better to do it by paper? Or is it better to do it electronically? So we strongly encourage people to file electronically because there's going to be less errors. It's going to be processed faster. And if you combine it with direct deposit, you're going to get your refund much faster. And especially in this COVID era, last year we had a lot of people at IRS working from home the paper returns were being processed very slowly. Mm. Things are a little better this year, but we really want people to file electronically. Okay. Now, there is a gig ec economy tax center. What is going on with the, the gig economy tax center? So we recognize at IRS that a lot of people work multiple jobs, deliver food, drive cars, and things like that. And there's a whole section on irs.gov for the gig economy tax center. It tells you what's income is reportable, but more importantly, it tells you what expenses you can deduct and how you should keep track of those expenses so that you could use those expenses to offset your income. And is there any place that somebody can get assistance? So let's say that you know they, they're, they're using the tax software and it's still confusing and they say, I don't understand this question. How, how, can they get any help? Well, you can hire someone. You can get a return prepare, but also and get a for a complicated return, right? yes. <laughs> um, IRS.gov is a great website. I use it all the time. Okay. I, was, I was on there this morning looking up some information. Great publications. There's YouTube videos. There's forms. There's everything you need there. We have an 800 number, 800. 829-1040, 800-829-1040. And then also, we have local offices. You go to irs.gov, and you, at the very bottom, it says, find a local office. You punch in the zip code. We have an office in Albuquerque on Jefferson. We also have an office up in Santa Fe. Okay. Some great information for us from Brian Watson, who is with the Internal Revenue Services. We're getting ready for tax season coming up really soon. Brian, thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. On the 700 Club, reaching out to those in need, going to the far corners of the earth, making our world a better place to live. The pure joy of giving to others, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, clothing the poor. How Americans just like you are making an incredible difference around the world. On the 700 Club. Today we're going to go to one of my favorite Bible passages, which is in the book of James. I, I love the book of James. I preach often from the book of James at church because it's one of those call to action books. I think I was reading in a John Maxwell leadership Bible at the prelude, you know, before they talk to you about the, the book that you're going to read. And I think it was John Maxwell who made the statement that the book of James is one that you should read standing up because it calls you to action. I've never forgotten that. Listen to some of these opening statements that are made in James chapter 1. We'll pick up at verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, you got troubles of any kind? Okay, then this is for you. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it a gr uh, opportunity for great joy. Now, most of us don't look at a problem as an opportunity for great joy, but he's going to tell you why, and this is a great truth. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. I shared a message with uh, our congregation here at Evangel Christian Center just a few days ago talking about vacancies in our life. 
you ever gone past, probably back in the old days, did you ever go past a hotel or motel that had the vacancy, no vacancy sign on? And if it had vacancy, you knew that there was, there was room. And if it had the no vacancy, it meant you just needed to kept, keep driving. But you know what happens in your life and in my life when there's a vacancy? We're saying to God, God, I have room for you to do something in my life. You know what we act like if we feel like we have no vacancy, no holes in our life? It's easy to say, God, I've got this. I don't need your help. What is James saying to us? It's something for us to know that when our faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. When you have a vacancy in your life, it gives a chance for your faith to grow forward. And it says next, so let it grow. That's his next statement to us. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. When God is in your life, and he's speaking words of life to you, that is giving you the abundance that you need for true fulfillment in your spirit and in your life. So my encouragement for you today, are you going through a hard place? Are you going through a place where you say, I've got some holes, I've got some vacancies? Then don't be discouraged by that. Realize that this is the call for God to say to you, come back, come back, listen to what I have to speak into your life. Listen to what I want to say to you today. And if you will listen to me, your life will find fulfillment. You'll be transformed. And I'll take you to the next level that you need to go to. It's always a privilege, a blessing to be with you on Spectrum. Until we have the privilege of gathering again, have a blessed day.